Welcome to PCC Online. I'm Colleen Lacey and I'm so glad you've joined me here today for some time applying scripture to our daily lives. As we consider Pastor Lincoln's last message, his closing message from the Sunday teaching series, Understanding Your Bible, he talked about um, the distinctiveness of Christianity and he reminded us that Acknowledging that we believe Jesus is the only way to God, it's, it's not a statement that we make, it's not about us. That's what Jesus said, what he said in the Bible. God's divine sovereignty, his dominion and control over his whole creation, which is the world and all the inhabitants and everything that grows or is here, all of that is under his control and dominion. Um, it's a message throughout the Bible, and it's also in our own lives. And that's been an important thing for me in these, these past weeks. Um, sometimes it's a bold message that reminds us of who God is. It comes in the Bible we read of coming in the form of a famine, right? Or right now we are in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. Sometimes it's a quiet word, a whisper of assurance when your heart is troubled. Sometimes it's the fostering of courage to make the hard but God-honoring choices and decisions. It reminded me of a story of a couple of women in the Bible, two widows with no living children and no long-term financial support. The two women had no hope that their circumstances were going to improve, except that one of them knew God. They knew the God of Israel, the God who is sovereign over all the parts and pieces of our lives, over our world. And even in her despair, the woman who knew God did not waver in her belief that he is sovereign. I love that. We will read that um, in the midst of her sorrow, she interprets the circumstances of her situation as being God's act against her. But as we read the story over the next few weeks, you we will see that she realizes it's God's blessings. Um, and that is such that he is um, near and, and working through things and does extraordinary things in her life and in the other widow's life too. We are going to read today the first chapter of the book of Ruth. And we are just finishing, as I said, the Understanding Your Bible series that we've been in for a number of weeks. Just in a few weeks at our church, we will be beginning the fall series on Jonah, the runaway prophet. But in between time, I thought that we women could read Ruth together. It's actually the eighth book in the whole Bible. There's the first five that are often called the Pentateuch, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then, then we begin the history books, right? So there's Joshua and Judges and then Ruth. So that's where we are now. Ruth is a history story and it's a fascinating story. So let's go ahead and find that in our Bibles. Ruth. Here it is in my Bible. We will read a few verses and then we'll stop for some consideration and then pick up again and we'll read the first chapter. I love this story and I wonder if you might see with me, I like to think of this story as one of the but God stories. Okay, here we go, starting at verse one of chapter one of the book of Ruth. Oh, you know what? We didn't pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And I thank you for wise teachers that you have blessed our church with. I thank you for um, wise women who want to know more about your word. And I thank you that you are showing yourself 
evident and sovereign and near in all of the circumstances of our lives. And we give you praise and thanksgiving, Lord. Help us to learn what you want us to learn today from this word. Amen. Okay, okay, Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. And both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. This sets the stage for us of what is happening in this book. It's the family history that we've just shared, but there's something right here that we want to see about, um, about the circumstances, right? They are a, a Jewish family, an Israelite family, and they have left their country, their home country, um, where God has asked his people, has set aside for his people, and they are going to um, the country of Moab, which is a country that has been traditionally one of Israel's enemies. So they have gone to that country and um, they've, they first, um, they, they go there, they sojourn there, and then they remain there, they settle there. Um, interesting to see that happening. And now we see that her family grew by two with the daughters-in-law and that it reduced by three when all three of the men had died. And this is where we pick up at verse six. Then she, Naomi, then Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his, had visited his people and given them food. So the famine that had caused um, Naomi and her husband Elimelech to decide to take their sons and go to the country of Moab, the famine is now over. God, she acknowledges God is the provider and sustainer. He has provided, he sent the rain and provided food for the Jewish people. Verse 7, so she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Verse 9, The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. In some translations, that word rest is security or stability. The Lord grant that you may find security and stability in the house of your husband, meaning a future husband because they were young widows. Then she kissed them and lifted up their voices. Excuse me, then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Naomi is referring to a tradition in Hebrew families referred to as the Leverite marriage, where if a um, man died having not um, produced um, sons and daughters, then his um, widow could marry his brother and any children from that subsequent marriage would be um, uh, claimed to be the first husband's children to um, continue the lineage. And that was a very important part about um, in Jewish family history. Um, and so that is what she's referring to here. And she says, verse 12, turn back my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. 
if I should say I have hope, even if I have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then the two daughters-in-law lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. This is indicating that Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and returned to her parents' home where uh, Ruth clings to her mother-in-law. Verse 15, Ruth's, um, excuse me, verse 15, Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. This is such a great example for us of a woman determining to um, respect the heritage of her her husband's family and uh, what a wonderful statement your people shall be my people and your God my God let's keep that in mind as we continue to read here verse 19 so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem and when they came to Bethlehem the whole town was stirred because of them and the women said is is this Naomi and she said to them do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. The name Naomi means pleasant, and the name Mara means bitter. So she is declaring, because of her circumstance, that her name should be changed. She says in verse 21, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? Why call me, why call me pleasant? Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. When we read Ruth say, your people will be my people and your God, my God. Technically, the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship, uh, th that tie was severed with Malon's death, right? Except that um, Na Ruth is determined to return. And I love this. She's returning to Naomi's homeland. She's returning to a place she's never been before. She is um, willing to uh, leave behind her homeland, her family, and her gods, and go with Naomi to her homeland, to her family, to her God. And she says, your God will be my God. I love how God has used Naomi and through difficult circumstances, he has wooed Ruth to the point that she can say, your God will be my God. I think that's a great lesson for all of us. He draws us near to him against all odds. Ruth is leaving her family, her homeland, and her gods in the midst of tragedy and disaster, God offers comfort in our sorrow. He offers us sustenance and provision, bread of life, in, even in the times that uh, brought about the end of the famine. And he brings blessings in a season of barrenness that, Mar that uh, Naomi would have continued that journey on her own. How much more 
difficult that would have been if her um, attentive daughter-in-law had not taken that journey with her. And we will see, as we continue to read, we will see that these women experience a joy that overcomes all of the sorrow that they have experienced. God is the God of good news. Let your God be my God. Um, and there's the whole thing about even, even when we are full of sorrow and despair, Naomi did not deny the sovereignty of God, right? She did say from her, the weariness of her soul and her sorrow, she said, you know, I believe God has brought calamity upon me. Um, she could not see at that time that her future would include um, provision and hope and reconnection with family and even grandchildren, right? She couldn't um, believe that out of bitterness would come beauty, but God can do that. And I love that we have this example here of um, she puts all of her, all of her weariness of her soul in what she calls herself. She says, don't call me Naomi, meaning pleasant, but call me Mara, which means bitterness. But you know what? She doesn't have, she doesn't have the authority to change her name. God gives us our name and he changes it. Um, he tells us what our name is. He names us. He tells us that we are his children. Um, there are verses in the New Testament where um, he calls his children forgiven. He calls his child beloved child. And he calls us redeemed. And that's what we are going to see, life and hope redeemed out of sorrowful circumstances for Naomi and Ruth because they've trusted God. And that is the distinction that we have in our Christian faith is that there is only one way to God and it is through Jesus. It is through belief that he has the power of uh, the authority of the changes in our lives that we need. And um, on this side of the cross, um, we have Jesus Christ um, who took the sacrifice, who sacrificed himself for us. Um, and I think that you will see that played out in the next three chapters as we go. That's where I want to stand, unwavering in my assurance that God is sovereign. When so many circumstances right now are complex and complicated and certainties abound, but God. That's a favorite phrase that's come to mean so much to me over the past several years. It sparks hope and a tingling of a deeper assurance. God's got this. Whatever is the this in in your family circumstances right now, in your wrestling with what you're reading in the word, in your consideration of what is happening in our community. I don't know what's going to happen, but God knows. And that's where I'm landing. That's where I'm standing in assurance and waiting to see what the Lord does with confidence and with assurance and standing on the truth. Thank you, ladies, for joining me here today. Let's pray before we close today. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Lord, for this time with your word to consider and see how each of us can um, find in Scripture um, hope and encouragement and trust in you, even when circumstances seem quite dire. But, Lord, you are the God of hope and faith and rescue and we thank you and we praise you for that lord would you encourage each of us by your word to trust you more deeply and to share that with someone else um, in small and big ways that you will bring to us this week we thank you and we praise you for that lord amen ladies thanks so much for joining me here today i look forward to seeing you sunday at worship services at 8 30 or 11 and also there's a fun family service in between at 10. 
Um, and I'll see you next week here for chapter two of Ruth. God bless. Bye for now. Thank you.